Hi, this is Moses Jacobs uh, in mid-December, and I am going to um, introduce a recording we made on the 2nd of December 2020 with the bar of spoken word. The bar of spoken word usually when before COVID met in the Barras Folk Club in Kelowna Kilty. And this was a very special session because we started with a live stream directly from the back of the Barras pub, which wasn't open, no audience, but they had gotten a grant to uh, make a live stream. And there two poets, songwriters performed. The first one was Paul McMahon from Belfast, who now lives in Kelowna Kilty and sang his song. There's a couple of songs and this was followed by an interview by me about change because the theme of the whole session was all about change. Our next performer was Dave Lorden, who is from Kelowna Kilty, a prolific poet and performer and educator who now lives near Dublin. Also, we had an interview afterwards and he later joined the session briefly because what we started in the Barras, we continued online and the first uh, say, it, not item on the agenda, but person on the agenda was Rob Worrell, who has been to our live sessions before and participated in two Zoom sessions. And what he had to say during those sessions about change really interested me because it connected the personal and the social and perhaps, may, yeah, in a way, the political. Unfortunately, during the transition from live stream to Zoom recording, uh, there were a couple of minutes where the recording got lost. And so Rob starts mid-sentence, which is a bit annoying because you don't know exactly what he's talking, talking about. It's not nobody's fault, but we thought we could add something. So I want to ask him, Rob, you are a, an expert and a practitioner in place-based leadership development. I got it right this time. So <laughs> could, you, could we start by... Um, can I start by asking you what, how do you describe that? What is place-based leadership development? Okay, thanks Mose and thanks for the introduction. Um, place-based leadership development is where we bring together groups of leaders from different sectors. So that could be the public sector, the private sector and not-for-profit sector within a locality such as a county or a town and we help them work on specific issues. So the idea is as they work together, they are trying to address a specific issue or themes within an issue. So in the context of the work I do in Kenya, for example, the issue is urban violence prevention. So uh, I, work with, I work with a Danish non-governmental organization called Dignity based in Copenhagen and also a non-governmental organization called Midwest Human Rights Network, which is based in uh, Nukuru County in Kenya. So we work with groups of leaders in two, in two areas. One is uh, Nukuru, which is a city of about 250,000 people. And one which is Nevasha, which is also another, which is a town in the same, in the same county, Nukuru County, with about, I think it's about 90 or 100,000 people live there. And I've been working for the past four years with groups of leaders there, getting them to work together, enabling them to work together to look at particular issues of urban violence. So that's all violence within an urban area um, and, and, and helping them to address key issues and agree actions they want to take, um, Trying out, uh, trying out these actions and activities and then reporting back on what worked and what didn't work. Um, the reason we talk about being place-based is because this is above the individual or the organization or the sector. And we are trying to get people to say, what do you want for the place where you live? Because when we live in a place, yes, we're, we're a citizen within a place, but also, we're probably at the same time as me being a police officer, for example, I'm probably also a, a husband and, and a father uh, and a neighbor. And the common, the common thing that we might all want together is that we want to, the place where we live, work and carry out leisure activities, we want that to be, we want that to be safe. Um, and whilst we might have different opinions about, uh, about the causes of issues, 
we all want the same thing, which is a safer place to live and work and be. So that's why we that's why we do things at the level of place. And obviously within within this within this um, arena or or context, um, it's actually quite complex because we're 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 dealing with with we're asking people how they relate to place, but we're also asking them what they want, what they how they want their place uh, to be where they live, and it's complex because. Uh, it's about how we relate to ourselves. It's about how we relate to each other. It's how we relate to our wider sector, and then how we relate to the to the wider place, to the wider area, to the wider locality. And the place, the place could be a could be a neighbourhood. It could be a it could be a town. It could be a city. It could be a county. But what we what we do work is we work within a defined, normally a defined geographical area that is recognized by by all the participants. And one of the one of the key issues can be within that place is that we all have ideas about different people from different sectors. And there might, because of our past experience, there might be a high level of distrust, for example, that we need to work through. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before we go on to the actual recording that we did before, I want, want to ask you, you also have worked and are working perhaps in Ireland where you are now based, although you, yeah. Yeah, I'm, 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 I've, worked, I've worked in a couple of places in Ireland, um, introducing the concept of place-based leadership development to improve collaboration. And what I'm, what I'm hoping is that uh, once COVID, uh, once 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 we're through COVID, that I'll continue that work. So, as an example, I've worked with um, I've worked with a Cork City Local Community and Development Committee and got them to think about how they would like to improve things in Cork City. So we did a, we did a two day workshop um, where the leaders got together and looked at how they could improve the envir environmental issues within Cork City, for example. Now um, that followed on from um, from me speaking at a national conference and also holding a workshop at the national level. And what we're hoping is that um, as we develop these ideas, that there might be um, there might be places in, in in Ireland where we can work with groups of leaders on specific issues. And there's a um, there's an area in, in in Dublin, for example, where we're hoping we're going to be able to work with groups of leaders, subject to funding, on um, looking at how we can we can improve the outcomes for communities. It could be around uh, could be issues around uh, around urban violence, but it could just as also, also as easily be um, climate change, or it could be uh, reducing um, alcohol and, and and drug dependency or, or drug abuse. The, the context, the issue is actually decided by the, by the area, by the groups of leaders in that area. And before, before I let you go, because, um, can I ask one question? And you don't yeah. have to give a, a huge answer because you could write a book about that, I think. But what do you do? I, in Kenya, there has been political violence around yeah. elections. Uh, in Dublin, for example, there is so, uh, such a thing as gang violence, yeah. which is, you know, both yeah. deadly. How do you deal or would you deal with people who just want to control the area who say look i don't care what you do i want to be the, the, the king the boss the big person yeah i mean do, or the the most important resident on an estate yeah okay Basically, same thing okay um the, the way i the, the the way i work with um organizations is there has to be what i work normally with is with the leaders who is with the leaders who are involved with agent with the agencies that are trying to improve life in that area. Okay. So this could be this could be the private sector, this could be the public sector, this could be the not-for-profit sector. So this would include this would include the Gardi, this would include local government, this would commune community organizations and community leaders, this could be include the prisons, this could be include public health. So it's now, more about if, about what you do with gangs than actually talking directly to gangs. We, yeah, I, I, in my case, I wouldn't be talking directly to gangs, although there are situations where you do have people who have previously been in gangs do come into the development programme. So that has happened. 
But okay. normally it's about the leaders that are working in this context, in the situation. Okay. So it would, be, it would be those leaders that are working directly and trying to improve how they work together. And trying okay. to agree, develop trust, build trust and a common understanding of what they want to achieve together. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. All, all, everything what you say makes a lot of sense. And I really thank you for being with us both here and <laughs> no problem. in hindsight in the Barras and hopefully no in the future at some stage as well. Thank you very much, Rob Borrell. Over to the Barras Zoom session. Thank you. Thank you. Public health, politicians, private sector. Um, who all have different perspectives on each other and where there's a high level of distrust. There's lots of distrust. It's a bit the same in Ireland, but it's not around violence. All I, all I, you, for me, urban violence just happens to be the problem. The, the approach I'm taking actually works on other problems. It could be, it could be climate change. It could be another problem. So why, what are we doing when I'm trying to work with these people? We're basically trying to get people, we're basically trying to get people to think about how they think about themselves and how they relate to themselves, how they relate to other people, how they relate to their wider sector, how they relate, how they relate, and how they relate to their organization and how they relate to wider place. Why place based? Because we ask people, what do you want? What do you want? What's best for your place? Which is the same why I asked you this question in the beginning. What, how do you relate to where you live? And if you ask people this, it's more complicated than this, but if you ask people this question, they connect because they have to collect at a deeply human level. So if I'm a civil society activist that is working with Patrick and Patrick's like a policeman and the police, I think the police, I distrust the police because the police have a history of violence against society in Kenya. But if I can understand where Patrick's coming from when he even wants to work with me at a very human level, Patrick is also a father probably. He might have kids. Uh, he might have, he might, he might, and he wants, where his locality is, he wants the best for that locality. So if we can, if we can have, if, if we can facilitate conversations and work together and develop trust in a place-based setting, we can change the way we see each other and we can change the dynamic and we can change and we can change our world at least. And I, and I don't tell them what their issues are. They know what their issues are. I facilitate a dialogue at these different levels with other people. We have a very strong local partner organization that gets the people together and we work together to try and work towards getting people to see that if they want to have a more effective society, a more, sorry, a more just society in terms of the urban violence context. We can only, we can only do that by working effectively together. And within that, there's lots of contradictions. So going back to Patrick, Patrick knows that he's had a lived experience of the police being aggressive to him. But he also knows that the policemen he's working with in the programme want the same as what he wants. So we kind of have to challenge ourselves to transcend, draw on our lived experience and transcend some of our lived experience to enable this transformation to happen. But this transformation can only happen if I, as a leader, challenge myself as well. So you have leader development and you have leadership development. And the ship only happens if we work together. The leader development is how I work with myself as a person. That's from the inside out. But if I really want to affect change and work with other people, I also have to be influenced by the outside in. And the starting point, we've realized that the starting point of all this is, is understanding each other and, and mindset, our state of mind, how open we are to, to, to working in a different way, to seeing in a different way. And if you don't have these things, then you can't change in any way, but it's the same. You can't change with how you work with your kids. You can't change with how you work with your colleagues. You can't change with how you work with, with, with wider society. And that's, and that's a tiny kind of, for me, that's why it's important that I think about how I relate to my locality. And then it's also important about how I relate to myself. Because I'm, if I'm not honest with myself on my own 
assumptions and prejudices and I can't park them. I can't, I can kind of change but not transform. And then the final thing on change that I wanted to say is that we've also realized that if we want people to change, we also have to understand what they're losing. So there's kind of a difference. People, people think change is hard. Change isn't hard, transition is hard. So for example, all the time, I reckon that most of you can probably change your breakfast cereal in the morning without a problem. I reckon most of you can probably change your clothes or your hairstyle and, or, or even change country or change job. That's not what's difficult. What's difficult is actually the transition moving into a new phase. Before you can really accept any change, you're letting go of something. And we have to understand what it is people are losing. In any change, there's a loss. And until we can accept that loss, we can't move into a kind of place. There's the loss, there's accepting the loss. Then we move into a place where we're kind of unsure, we're accepted the loss, but we're kind of still all over the place. And then finally, we move into a place of new beginnings. And what, and the thing that I think is missing in this change is in any talk about change and transformation, whichever way you define it, is that sense of loss. And sometimes the loss is my prejudices. Because going back to Patrick, if or sorry, Patrick, just using the, the name as the example, going back to Patrick, if Patrick accepts he can work with his policemen, he has to accept that all the police aren't bad. That's the kind of level we're getting people to work at. Because otherwise, and that's that's a, that's a challenge. That's a challenge for people. And that's that's kind of, in a nutshell, <laughs> what I wanted to say. So I'm sorry that's not not scripted, kind of planned but not planned, but it kind of, I think it kind of gives you a perspective anyway. So um, I hope that was I hope that was kind of to time and um, um, was of some interest. Thanks. Rob, it was of great interest and also bang on Thanks, time. Right. Thank you. <laughs> So do you want people to answer your question? That you yeah, asked? it would be good to answer the question and also any perspectives people have, because I think that might be a good starting point about how, because I think in, I suppose I asked that question because that's kind of how we start, that's how I kind of start, get people having those conversations with each other. I mean, to give you, to give you a context, we normally work on, we normally work with two day workshops so they're quite intense. And, and my approach is facilitation, not really, talking at people for a long time because people have to get to their own level of understanding and it's more important. Most of, most of the learning comes from people in the room. So I would say 70 to 80% of the learning actually comes from each other. I think you're right. That, that's exactly right. And I think even teachers or facilitators, anyone that is in a position of authority, if you like, or holding court over the group, they learn as much as well from. Yeah. Students. Yeah. It goes round. And also, like for me, I have a huge sense of place with Clonacilty because I come mm. from Clonacilty. And my ideas about politics, I've been a political activist my whole life. And I, I always bring that with me no matter where I'm living. So that came from Clonacilty. That came from watching society on my street, a working class street. And the biggest thing I noticed in, I was born in 1950, mm. was the lack of contraception. So we spent like decades fighting for contraceptive rights. And we're, we're still more or less, you know, it's not refined yet. Yeah. Um, that sort of thing. And I always bring that with me, no matter where I'm living, even where I am here now in Cork City, there, there are loads of campaigns going on, even with COVID. Like we did a Zoom meeting with Polish um, women living in Cork that were against what the government were doing to claw back the mm. abortion rights they have there, that, that sort of stuff. I always relate to my community in that way. So. Um, and what does that bring you? Oh, it brings me satisfaction. It means okay. I'm putting a kink in the system, the, the systemic ab abuse of working class people. Yeah. If you can go up a notch and if you can hold on to what you've gained, it's huge satisfaction, mm. huge. Okay. I'm sure a lot of people deal with a lot of change, kind of modeling in their workplaces and different varieties of work. 
the background of the HSE. Mm. We used to get all these study days and facilitating change. But there used to be some fierce resistance to the change managers who'd come in yeah. to rebrand the HSC and call patients yeah. became clients became, you know, I don't know what was the last word I had for them, <laughs> but uh, there was a huge amount of resistance and uh, scepticism because you know, we used to have all these reflective study days and the older members of staff had a big fight in their hands changing into their mindset, into the consumer approach, you know. That the, that the that the clients are consumers of the HSC. Yeah. It was a huge mindset change. I just remember bringing you up and down, Rob, to to the barras, and you'd be telling me about this. Yeah. Just yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's interesting, Mags. I think as well because um, I think sometimes see. I think resistance to change is good, but I think the problem is well. One of the challenges is that a lot of a lot of change initiatives fail to, to fail to even connect and acknowledge the pe- the things people are losing. The resistors, yeah. <laughs> so, so so people are labelled as people are labelled as resistors, but sometimes those with longer years in the organisation are not listened to, and mm. if people were at least given voice. So in the Kenyan context, we try to make sure everybody in the group is given voice. So we call that bearing witness. And that's one of the things that we think from the program has made it so in, impactful, was because even the quietest people are given a voice or enabled to, to have a voice. As a matter of interest, Rob, because I was just talking to Dave about that. Do you believe that there are people who are sort of evil? who are resisting change to the very last and do not want to change, even if it's pointed out to them, for example, that they do harm? Uh, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's about being evil, but I think there are people who can only see their own perspective and only have that mindset. And if you only have that mindset, if you have no level of self-awareness or you're a sociopath and you just don't care, like AK Trump, I think there are people like that. And don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean because we change a few people in the police that everybody in the police in Kenya has changed. They're not. Clearly they're not. We're not that. But what we are doing and what we are trying to do is we're trying to we're trying to develop facilitators now. We have a new experimental program for facilitators. And also we're trying to we're trying to develop a cohort of young people who can also do the same thing that I'm doing so that we have some kind of legacy. And it's not easy. It's difficult subjects we're talking, we're talking about, you know. Yeah, because the, because the horrible things have happened around those elections, or you know, are maybe still happening. Yeah, know? they have. How but do what, you overcome that? Yeah, they have. But what we found is the area we're working in, the actual level of violence at the last elections was much lower than the ones in two thousand thirteen. Mm-hmm. So my my contribution is part of a wider program, but I think we are we do seem to we we we've had the program evaluated. And there does seem to be have had there does seem to have been um, some some impact, positive impact. Uh, another thing we talked about was: can you have a revolution without violence? Can you have an evil? Can you have change like so social change without violence? We we I don't even monopolize the conversation, and mine's only one example. But I think there has been some. There has been. I think that can only happen if you have a certain amount of attitudinal change, mindset change with how people work together. Yeah. I, I don't think if there is violence during or after a revolution that it's going to come from the masses, the working class. The violence is going to come from those who want to continue with capitalism. Mm. Nobody else. And we should defend that. We have to hold on to any gains we make if there's a revolution. And there is no doubt, I'd have no compulsion about using violence, if that's what it took. Um, even Dave's t-shirt reminded me of that today, like Tom Barry and um, what he did. And I think he was quite right. Even though that wasn't a revolution, it didn't turn into a socialist. Where Ireland are a socialist world, obviously, but that's what I'm talking about if we were at that stage. Um, the violence will, won't come from workers or pensioners like me or, you know, any of the ordinary people. What do other people think?
I'm just wondering about what other people have to think about the question about how they relate to themselves and how they relate to how do people how, how did that land when I asked that question how do you relate to yourself it's difficult to think of a good answer I think or, or I, I mean how do you relate to where you live is kind of easier yeah because when you ask the question I thought oh my god I don't really think much about where I live because yeah. uh, mm. I come to work. I'm actually still at work now, and then go home, go to bed next day. Yeah, wake up early and come to work. So I don't really think about it in terms of. I and mean, maybe I think about some things. Um, is it safe? You know, mm. some of the neighbors. Mm. You know, I'm not sure about them, but. That's about it, and and um, and it actually made me realize that often with the environment I'm in, I don't relate much to the environment. I just do what I'm doing. So even at work, I focus yeah, okay. on work and um, tend not to get involved in the politics and all of that. So um, so that was a bit scary thinking about that because I hadn't thought about it that way but then the question how do I relate to myself that's like even more difficult to, <laughs> to, to think about it's like I don't know and I, I, I should know because I'm a psychiatrist but I don't know. <laughs> I never, I think you would answer that question if something occurred at work if something happened at work that jeopardized, you know, the future of, of you and your colleagues, or if there was an injustice, you wouldn't yeah. let it pass. So they no. know. Yeah. Then you'd know. Yeah, this is true, actually. Yeah. So, um, but in a way, it's it's even more scary. So it feels like most of the time I'm just a zombie going on with work until something happens, and then. Um, uh, maybe then I get involved, but I think it's just because I've never sat down and thought about it. Just yeah, this is this is this is one of the questions we. The reason I ask this question as well because it's one of the questions we ask some of our people in the program, and the way we do it, the way we do it, which is easier, we do it storytelling. So we use storytelling and vulnerability. So one of the things we do is I I talk about I talk about I, I talk about some of my life story from early on. So I went to, I went to Nigeria in two thousand three and found my found my birth father. And I talk a bit about some of the chapters in my life before then. So I stand up and show a certain amount of vulnerability, but it's far enough away from me that I don't. When I first did it, I usually get emotional, but I don't now. I just do it, and then we get people to we get people to, to we we ask people. If your life was a book, how many, how many, what, what would the chapters be? And we get them to share that together. We don't ask them to share it in plenary, and we ask the narrator to tell their story, and the and the listener tells that person what values come out of the story, as a one to one. And this is how we get people to start relating to themselves, because they're having that conversation about well, from what you told me, Nick, the values I heard was this. And then when we're in black in back in plenary, we don't ask people to tell the story or talk about the values. We just ask people, how was that experience? And this this kind of gets people relating to them, relating to each other and relating to themselves. It's so in a way, in a way, it's a kind of healing thing to 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 tell your own story or yeah. to realize your own story. Yeah. Like connect the dots. Yeah. Yeah, but sometimes... Um, I think if anyone... Yeah, before still... you continue, if anyone wants to go on the open mic, Lauren will be facilitating it. So you should put your name into the chat. Would that be okay, Lauren, for you? Yeah. I was Perfect. just... I was, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interject. Yeah, no, I, but... no way, you're okay now. Just I was just thinking that... that Sometimes, like you're talking about storytelling, Rob, mm. sometimes people don't really know who they are because there's community stories, 
class stories mm, mm. and all other kind of stories and people take on roles from mm, those stories mm. yeah. and they become an identity through mm. that uh, through that story because I remember I was actually in one of the most well-known occupations of a building six months we mm. occupied a building working class people and what we what we found out from that, talking to the people, that people didn't actually know who they were. They didn't really know their own stories because sometimes the stories have been kind of whitewashed mm. and kind of changed. Mm. And the stories that is like the neoliberal story has come in and people have taken that story on. So when you say who are we? No, I'm not I'm not saying who are we. Yeah. I'm saying how do you relate to yourself, which is different. And no, it, and, it, and, yeah. and it's and it's and it's very much at and it's very much at an individual level. And we yeah. the way we start is we need to start somewhere. Yeah. No, I'm not demi criticizing that. I'm just all I'm trying to say is that the whole thing about who we are sense of place, sense yeah. of belonging, sense of all that is kind of uh, kind of is platformed from what we are led to believe who we are. Because a lot of people believe they are something which they are not because mm -hmm. they've been told mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a fascinating question because I I don't know quite often say that I don't much like myself, but I do really like where I live and yeah. I chose to live here. So that's, you know, I must have some decent judgment in that respect. Uh, it's also a bit fascinating because like, I live, as Margaret said, I, I live, I say Coventry, but I don't actually live in Coventry. Mm. I live about mm. 20 minutes mm. outside Coventry. So it's a sort of semi-rural community. Mm. But I spend a lot of time in Coventry, which is a big city. Mm. And around here, it's kind of a little bit more insular and quiet. And uh, dare I say it, a lot probably less multicultural. Mm. And mm. Very, um, in Coventry, it's a big student place, mm. uh, lots of different cultures, and there is that sense of like rich and poor more so, mm. and um, there is quite a bit of street violence, but not that I've actually witnessed it, but you've got that feeling of it being a little bit edgy. Mm. So it's kind of a, a fascinating place, a fascinating thought of how do you relate to yourself and how do you fit that into a sense of place? Yeah, because and I, I, one, of, one of the things I found, for example, a, a very practical example, one of the things I found in one city I worked with was um, there was a guy who was, uh, who, was, who, was, um, who was in charge of trying to regenerate part of the city. And he was in charge of one part of the city, but he lived in another part of the city. So the part he lived in was very affluent. And the party was trying to lead, suppose leading on the regeneration, was actually was actually very was actually quite disadvantaged. And his idea of what was needed in the place was far was was was, was based on where he lived, not where the people were. And he found out that the only way he could really understand what was needed in that place was actually to go down to the front line and talk to the people who were actually working on the front line because they had more of a connection with the people and what we what we found there was that in one place there were several places because it's like people have said it's it's based on your lived experience and class and and, and other things like that so 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 that's I suppose that's the other reason we kind of asked that question and look through the lens of self and place and the layers in between yeah that's what I was trying to kind yeah, of say yeah. it's, it's multifaceted yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly yeah can I ask you something, Rob? Uh, people living in an estate, a relatively newly built estate, mm. which come from loads of other places, yeah. how would you turn that estate into a community? I mean, okay, it, 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 it's, I mean, how would you start? How would you, where, what would you, 
trying to help? Is that possible? Because in a way, like estates are a bit like the villages of old in the, in terms of how many people I, are there. I, I, I would say as, as part of my as part of my as part of my PhD research, which people are happy to read. You, if you read it to your kids, you soon put them to sleep. By the way, it's available free on the internet. But part of my part of my research showed that one of the biggest mistakes in Britain, for example, was they spent 50 years trying to regenerate, trying to regenerate areas. And they spent all that time on bricks and mortar and not on people and community. And I can, and I, and I, where I used to live in North Tyneside, which is part of, which is near Newcastle, but separate from Newcastle, there's a state called the Meadowell Estate and they've spent, they spent millions and millions on that estate. The problem is, is they didn't start with the people. So we, so what we tend to do is, is we tend to do bricks and mortar regeneration when we should be looking at the social side, because what, bricks and because bricks and mortar. So, so how would I start? I think I would start by getting the people together and see if there's any exploration of 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 commonality and common purpose and start those conversations. And whether there are particular things, whether there are particular things that people want to try and improve. That's the only place it has to start with human connection and human conversation. And if there isn't, then I, I, I think it would, you just end up with communities of interest, which are, which are, which are, which are there and which are relevant too. but that's not the same as communities of place for me. It's, it's, you know, well, you can, if, if you think about it, and in this case, I am thinking about it, then even to get the community, people together is difficult in a in a standard estate because all the houses are individual like you know like yeah you, yeah i think and yeah you, yeah you, no, the, normally normally people convalesce around an idea and normally it's an issue if you yeah. have an issue <laughs> and you have a common issue if you have an issue people convalesce and then it depends on on having someone who can facilitate that conversation or there is or there is a conversation a conflict that's also yeah but but it has to start but it has to start with it has to start with the lived experience of the people in the room so so we so i try and start with what is the lived ex because people are experts in their own lives so for example if we're going to if we're going to talk about i don't know sexual violence in kenya we would look to the local people in kenya the, yeah. the, the experts their local people on the ground to do research and set the context for that conversation with their partners it, i i'm facilitating a conversation that local people want to have it's not for me to go in and talk about sexual violence or my perspectives or my experience because in that sense my experience is not important it so, so you, you would perhaps look at at what people have in common in terms of problems or in terms of yeah if i think if there's a problem identified and people want to work together that the, the approach we take is you know it could be it could be climate change it could be it could be mental health it could be any issue but but it's just that in this context we work at the place level rather than the organization or the sector because we know that yeah. if we just work in one sector the solutions don't work not locally Thanks, Rob. Okay, thank um, I think we should probably close this part of it by now because it's 20 past 10. If yeah, you thank you. Thanks for listening and I hope it was... Oh, it's very uplifting, Rob. <laughs> really instructive. It is. It, it, everyone is going away tonight thinking about your <laughs> you know, and it, there might even be a poem in it. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Yeah, I, well, I hope so. I, I try to write poems occasionally, so yeah, I hope so. I loved your stuff, by the way, Dave. Thanks a million, Rob, and uh, it was good listening to there. I'm sorry I didn't catch the start, but uh, no. it, it's, a great, it's a great idea to do meetings like this and have these kind of conversations. Yeah. And uh, I had a look at your LinkedIn, and I, I, I'm interested in your work, so I'll check all that out. Good man, thanks. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, Dave, did you want to say something about change? Um, Dave, Lord. Is, yeah. is from yeah. Can I first say? Can I say something? Else? Can I say something else first, Margaret? If you don't mind. Yeah. I, I, just so everybody knows, I, I'm an old friend of Margaret's, but uh, I haven't seen her for a while now, and uh, I've just been kind of back and forth on the internet. But you're looking absolutely fantastic. Your hair is beautiful. If you don't <laughs> Thank mind. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's golden hair. It's golden hair. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Are you putting the colours, Margaret? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's lovely. 
I don't, yeah. I, I don't buy makeup. I don't use makeup, colors, jewelry. I have yeah. no time. I'd rather yeah, have no. beauty. I'd rather and have beauty. I, Margaret, not for a long time. Not for a long time because <laughs> I want makeup. Now. Anyway, <laughs> exactly. I used to wear makeup in Connacilty, you know, when I was 13 years of age because I was into the band called The Cure. Oh, and really? I, I, I love used to wear that. lipstick oh, and eyeshadow oh. and all that. It was fantastic. Like, you know, I, nobody would go near me because everybody was afraid of my dad so I could do what I wanted. You know, it was fantastic. <laughs> As a teenager, I remember him well. Kilt, up, up in Tanakilty, my girlfriends, my friends, the girls that I was friends with, they weren't my girlfriends, but they were girls I was friends with. Uh, they'd put on the pseudo cream and the eyeshadow and the lipstick and all that. <laughs> myself, that name used to love it. But yeah, change. But change is something. Life has changed. The universe has changed. You never, you never step into the same river once. Not to mind twice. Uh, we, we are continuously responding. Uh, to change and we are continuously uh, changing ourselves and um, history uh, you know uh, is, 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 is is changes uh, and changes happen in history which are really beyond the ken or the power of the individual to influence overall uh, but as part of our uh, communities and our networks and you know uh, our uh, activist organizations our poetry clubs whatever it might be uh, we can participate. You know, I, I don't think really that uh, there's any such thing as individual change, you know, or, or even really a, a functional thing such as an individual really uh, in the world. Uh, when we come into the world, uh, we are, as the philosopher Heidegger puts it, thrown uh, into existence. And even the very words we use do not belong to us. All the meanings that they have accrued have accrued over generations and hundreds of years and centuries so we owe our individual existence to not only to the living but also to the dead uh, so for me the concept of an individual is is a troubled one and a problematic one and it's one that we have only had uh, pretty recently actually uh, and uh, you know so i think change is something which happens at, at, at big scales and that individuals react to that I, I don't think that individuals i uh, really make change i think change is a is a tectonic thing and we are swept along in it. And what we do is we swim, uh, you know, uh, in that uh, in that tide, if you like, you know. So, uh, but look, uh, I, I have to go now, guys, because I have to meet my family who I haven't seen for months. And, and one of the things that has been uh, great about being invited down here is that I'm able to say hi to my mom, you know, for the first time well, in ages. Wish her well, wish her well from Yeah, and my dad and yeah. my brothers. And uh, I'm really happy to have uh, to uh, make contact with the, the Barrow Spoken Word. And I would be really delighted if people kept me, you know, hooked in and all that and so on and so forth. And maybe I'd get to participate in, in things like this down the line. It'd be great. OK, so thanks, thanks a million. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thank and, you, Dave. Uh, Lovely all the best to your family. Absolutely. Dave, thanks. before you go, your hair is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very no, much. I, I really do. I love a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. We can go straight into the open mic. Great, perfect. So first up to the open mic is Anne. There's some more people. <coughs> uh, this is all about change and this is called Collected Wisdom of the Internet. It's uh, based probably a lot on uh, Facebook and Twitter discussions. Have you got any change? Change, you can keep it. So much shared advice, is it real or just for likes? Change your mind, change your mindset, as if saying cheer up would stop someone being depressed. It's change the record, it's getting boring. You change your tune if it happened to you. Change your currency, book a holiday. We all want change, but it makes us uneasy, especially if we're not the ones to choose. Change for change sakes, just to refer to authority. Sorry, I'm... The change is as good as the rest. Demand change, protest, but do it peacefully, unobtrusively. Causing disturbance could end in arrest. Want change? Sign a petition. Write to a politician. Be the change you want to see in the world or blame the world when it stays the same. Don't expect a different outcome if you always repeat the same action. Change your outlook. If you can't, change your situation. Complain your career is going nowhere. Blame your education. If you don't have the drive to change your habits, to gain more qualifications or even send applications, change your credit score just to get a little more or give yourself a little credit for making tough decisions. Marketing is designed to tempt you. It doesn't have to leave you just with a change in your pocket for necessities with a week to go till payday, threatened with eviction. 
Rent is overdue because the corporate machine has changed your view. Confusing want with need. All you can eat data doesn't help you if you're hungry. Change your opinion, change your point of view, change your perspective. Try walking in someone else's shoes, change your understanding. Don't judge on first impression. You never know what someone else is going through. Spare a little change, please, or at least some compassion. If you think it's gonna be wasted, then support a charity. Change or reject your religion if you want to, but respect those who don't share your views. Don't change to please someone else, but if they love you, they shouldn't expect you to. But if you change your look, change your lifestyle, change your diet, but don't expect other people to change to suit you if you don't change for them. Change into a suit if you want to be taken seriously. Change your appearance if it makes you happy. Don't expect other people to change theirs when it's part of their identity. Chase change, but you decide you don't like it before you've even bite it. Complain you've no time to cook standing in the takeaway queue. Blaming someone else for an obesity crisis. Sex change, gender reassignment surgery. What business is it with us if someone else does with their body? Change your gaze, there's nothing to see. Change your nationality. If you can't change your nation or stay where you are, blame immigration. Wouldn't you want to move if you were under threat of torture or starvation? You can't change history just by airbrushing it. Change your story, change tomorrow's history. You can't change the past, but you can change the future. It needs more action than just moaning on Twitter. Climate change is fact or fiction, depends whether you believe science or ill-informed opinion. Turning a blind eye won't change your vision. As ice caps melt and disappear into the ocean, times change. Boomer, you were young once. Millennial, you get older. How about cutting the playground insults and creating positive change together? Change the clocks forward to see brighter mornings, but don't fall back when time when light gets darker. Seasons change, so does the weather. Be glad you're around to see it. Not everyone has that pleasure. Embrace change. Hug it like an old friend. Change your plans, change direction. Your first ideas aren't always the best ones. If you can't change the answer, are you asking the right questions? Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And next up we have Mags. Me, is it? Yeah. But... Gosh, uh, sorry. Okay. I don't want to... Girls know that we were working on change last night, so I had hoped to do a bit of editing of this, where I won't hold up the proceedings. Um, and I just say no to self at yesterday at tea time. And um, the, um, that's just a uh, prelude. <laughs> Reset, hire yourself as an agent, a young provocateur. Caps too tight, fling it off, be executive producer. Quit whinging, being a victim. Persecute it, take control. Change gears, potholes disappear. Reset sat nav to rock and roll. Four seasons in each morning, a year and every day. Change your time zone, go off peace, settle for one moment and stay. Change socks, fit new shoes, try cocktail coloured hair. Wipe the puss off your face and climb off the cross, get a life for God's sake. So the little song I have here features all the buzzwords that change resonate for me because everyone has their own individual little word um, that change sets off. And when I used to dance, it was all change, change, cycles changing. And I was doing art as always about striking a pose and changing it. So um, I'm changing into my uniform. So they're my references, if you can make sense out of this little one. And press cut if I'm going on too long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've been afraid of changes Cause I've built my life around you Time makes you older Children get older And I'm getting older too A little sneaky bit of Fleetwood Mac I'm not a change model Not a change predictor some theorem to be reasoned. Draw it by through me, 
pencil me in a category Don't change this body Rebrand it, reappraise it Refine it, fine tune it Don't change the canopy Keep my identity And all the mantras of my passions Follow changes in their fashion Dancing mantras Back, back, cycles change Chassis, jetis, cycles change Mantras of the artist Striking poses in the studio Pose, ten, five to change Sit, stretch, reach, now change Striking poses in the studio Capture changes, eyes and souls Shifting shapes, contouring all the highs and lows Change into your tunic, put on your morning breastplate Plaster on your shop face But I can change my heart and change my feelings Sometimes I change for seasons In the morning the sun will shine on sink on every hard evening and mold a template and find a better reason to move on as I've been afraid of changes cause I build my life around you and time makes you older children get older and I'm getting older too so change. That's a very abstract draft one. With a little bit of feedback back to on it. Thank you, Max. Thank you. And next up we have Bonzi. Okay. Um, the there was a question by Anne Atkins in the chat a bit earlier at the end of the conversation. Um, I Rob answered it too, I saw, wait a minute. Quest, question for Rob, anyone. Do we think that poets spoken word can influence change or do we just talk to like-minded people? <laughs> I, I don't know the, the answer to the latter question. It's just that it reminded me of uh, when I was 14 and I went, I was in school and this was in Amsterdam and um, secondary school and the teacher um, was reciting poetry some po and it really struck me and I think it changed me in that way I, I I'll try to translate it um, here it's a very short poet poem uh, it's called flame a foaming morning and my fiery laugh laughter drinks from immense bowls of air and earth, the opal day. I don't know if I've translated it rightly, but um, it, what it gave to me was the sense that somebody was living in a kind of uh, above normal world, at least that he could talk about that, about experiences that were beyond the mundane, beyond the material world. And that was for me at that stage in, of my life, it was really, really important that it even existed for someone else. And I think that's what poetry can give us, the experience of some, the lived experience of someone else that suddenly makes you feel like, okay, I'm, I feel caught and trapped. I think that th those are the worst times of my life and of maybe everyone's life. Maybe that's what depression is. You feel caught and trapped and you can't get out of that cage and then suddenly somebody opens a, a window and you see, wow, there is an outside world and maybe I can't get at it now, but it exists. And that month, that it's by a poet called, that's a poet called Hendrik Marsman and he's very interesting in the sense that he wrote a poem 
um, this was before the Second World War, in which he predicted his own death. Like he was on a ship, it was about a ship that sunk and that's how he died. Okay, that, that is my contribution today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next up we have Margaret. I don't think the word change is mentioned in this at all, but the change that it refers to um, is the difference between um, being able to meet up with somebody or dis it's titled um, distanced loving. Suffused with longing during COVID lockdown, bereft of your touch, pent up lovers lust. To find a solution to this frustration, sexting and surfing is now our station. Four months, four months imagining mind blowing scenarios, orgasmic virtuoso in cyberspace Nova. Having images of archived adventures of words softly spoken, of senses awoken. As we replay sessions from erotic recesses, unearthed from our minds, we scale new heights. A lifetime of fantasies exchanged and enacted, unbounded passion in hedonistic fashion. Veritable sexperts we've become, a sexual portfolio we've begun, undiluted erotica stream, stored in the iCloud of our dreams. Woohoo! <laughs> so great. Oh, excuse me while I wipe the steam off my screen. Thank you very much. Steaming um, windows. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, next up we have uh, Catherine. Hi everyone. Hi. Jesus, Mags, whoo, the steam, the steam. <laughs> the and I, I wrote this, um, my idea of ch this is, was inspired by um, the Cliffs of Moher and people who commit suicide off the Cliffs of Moher. It's very different from Margaret now, but it's the hope that if people can't deal with this world, that the next world that they go into is a welcoming world for them. And that it's, we, we don't know why people commit suicide, but we, I personally do hope that when they leap, that they leap into something that's easier for them than life was here. That some people aren't aren't just they just can't take um, life here. It's not easy for everybody. So I call this poem "Change." So dance with the fairy if she wants to dance with you. Change it might be a wonderful leap without your shoes into the comforting sea. The fronds gather to soothe your temples. Freya braids your hair. Neptune holds a feast. Welcome now. Everything changes. You are change and you are home. Lovely. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. And uh, last, but definitely not least, we have uh, Nick. Thanks, Lauren. I just, can you hear me all right? I'll just get this on the screen. Yeah, yeah perfect. Uh, this is a, um, a short prose piece. Whoops, where have you gone? A short prose piece, if I can get into it. Uh, here we go. And it's about, it's a metaphor and it's called Mind the Gap or The Last Cry of an Errant Albatross. I awoke with a jolt as the carriages jostled to a halt. I had not expected my journey to come to such an abrupt and unforeseen conclusion. And by the time I had gathered my thoughts, I was alone in the naked emptiness. My first concern was my luggage. I had been well attended by a station porter at my departure point and would certainly need assistance to negotiate the other platforms. I leaned out of the carriage window but could see nobody. The platform was eerily empty. 
enshrouded in an impenetrable autumnal mist. The globe lights shone a wavering yellow glow, illuminating a few square feet of walkway. All other passengers seemed to have vanished into the ether. The train and the connecting pipes hissed and gurgled until they too fell silent. And it was with some relief that I heard approaching the ring of hobnail boots, accompanied by the steely clatter of trolley wheels. The porter was an aging gent who looked beyond active service in any capacity. And it took me more than a few minutes to juggle my belongings through the narrow door into his hands one leather valise, one woven fabric portmanteau with leather strapping, a canvas duffel bag with my uniform and two suitcases containing my most important manuscripts, both awaiting publication. Much to my astonishment, the porter stood the duffel bag upright, untied the cord and pulled open the top, revealing the hard crown of my square rig cap beneath which lay shirts, jumpers and trousers. Are you returning to sea, sir? he asked. I doubt it, I said, trying to show my displeasure, unless another war breaks out, which, if you don't tie that back up smartish, could be imminent. He knotted the cord with umbilical significance, saying, well, you'll hardly be needing this lot again, will you? And he tossed the bag back into the carriage. Be more useful to someone else, wouldn't you think, Gov? In fairness, I couldn't argue with him. And although there was a relief at one less bag tarry, I did feel a wrench at the haste with which a lifetime's identity had been disposed. He next placed the portmanteau on the trolley and caused me much consternation by undoing the straps and unzipping it as though he was about to disembowel the thing. He had a quick flip through with seasoned expertise of a customs officer, then investigating in a similar fashion, the valise. You've half a dozen shirts, trousers, underpants, socks, sweaters, shoes, in addition to what you're wearing. How many pairs can one wear? <laughs> he winked, he winked, refastened the bags and with a nod threw both bags back into the carriage. Let them go back to where they came from. There's clothes there for half a dozen blokes, let alone one. You've more than enough in what you're wearing. He turned his attention to the manuscripts. Memoirs of a Jack Tar and The Last Cry of an Errant Albatross. A cynical smile appearing on his face. I knew where this was leading. In all honesty, I'd never expected to find an agent, and I could feel encroaching, anonymous obscurity. What did it matter, I asked myself. So what if my precious works, recognized thus far only by my flagging ego, were not to attain high notoriety? Who would give a fig? Before he had chance to make the move, I picked them up, contemplating their disposal. I walked the length of the train and finding the steam engine unattended, lifted the cases onto the footplate. I climbed up, opened the door to the firebox and within 20 minutes had rendered both manuscripts to oblivion. As I returned to the porter, I was enveloped in a veritable snowstorm of ash that fell about me and settled on my shoulders, a light yet bearable burden of failure. The night porter took one of the cases. I could use one of these, thanks. He handed me the other one, empty. Should be enough for all you're bringing with you. I listened as the hobnails and trolley receded into the night, wondering at the lightness of my empty suitcase. There you go. Oh. Thank you very much, Nick. And I spoke too soon about the end. Um, to finish us tonight, we're going to have Patrick. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm joining you from Canada. And uh, to pick up on what Rob was saying earlier, it's been 180 years since my family moved from Armagh to Canada. Yet 
I don't feel a sense of placement here. I feel a keen sense of displacement, mm. which is a little different. And uh, I think it can be found in many Irish yeah, who, yeah, yeah. In, 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 who are part of the diaspora. Anyway, the change I want to read from is about a death uh, and the passing over of a person I knew. And it begins in a very Canadian way with, it snowed this week. It snowed this week on learning of your death. I thought about you. There's no music that can accompany these nights. I've given up trying. In silence, I write. Was it autumn? Yes, I think so, that I climbed the stairs to your darkened apartment among the trees and heard the passing automobiles. That evening we spent looking at the photographs, sometimes talking, sometimes quiet, moving softly, carefully into each other's thoughts. I could see the trees through the window above the warm bath you drew for me. On the floor on my sleeping mat among the photographs, I did not lie with you that night, nor ever, not understanding your need for the warmth of an embrace. I failed you, my friend. Thank you. No. Oh. Really moving. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm glad that you uh, jumped in to read there at the end. Oh. Um, thank, thank, thank you to everybody on the open mic. That was really, really wonderful way to finish off the uh, marathon session that we've had tonight. And not to keep you too much longer, but just a couple, couple of announcements for the new year when we will meet again. Uh, is going to be on the 13th of January, uh, okay. lucky 13, no doubt, no doubt. And the theme is going to be don't worry in order to cheer us up in the deep darkness of January. So uh, hopefully that one will be a good bit of fun. Um, if you don't want to miss out on that and you're not on the email list, then please add your email just in the chat or send it to Margaret privately if you don't want to share it publicly and we will add you to the list. And then coming up in February, um, we're very excited to be having uh, another workshop. Um, for those of you at the Haiku workshop, um, that all went very well. So we're going to do another workshop and this time it's going to be on found poetry, which is definitely a reaction to our contemporary society where there's just too much stuff around and found poetry can be, can be very good fun as well. So we hope that you will join us for that. And very lastly, um, always ideas um, and involvement are welcome so if you have any ideas anything that you would like to see or if you would like to be involved in uh, uh in the process or hosting or running or anything just get in contact on facebook or via email and that would be very welcome so thank you everybody okay thank you lauren thank and you. Mag margaret for hosting you and wonderful Really, thank you, everybody. Really coming up with the ideas as well. And Rob, thank you very, very much. Yeah, for no, thanks for everybody for listening. Thank, thank you and contributing as well. well done. Thanks for all the uh, amazing poems and songs and conversation and discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank everyone. And have a, um, a light Christmas. Whisper okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Christmas. And a hopeful new year. Okay. What is it going Christmas. to be? Change, I suppose. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for being there. Okay. Bye bye. 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 Bye.